from Boston, Crockett's Victory Garden. Welcome to Crockett's Victory Garden. I'm Jim Crockett. And the first thing I want to tell you today is how to prune evergreens, such as this yew, which is known as a hip yew, and prune it in such a way that you're not aware of any pruning having been done. I want to look you look uh, down here, for example, at this one which I have pruned. And you can see no evidence of pruning cuts whatsoever. The secret on pruning is to not to try to alter the natural shape of any plant. This plant is naturally columna. If I tried to make it spreading, it would only shoot up straight again. But now let's go to the actual pruning process itself. Here is where we reach down inside and take out a cane such as that so that you're not, you won't see it. Now I want to say that this particular plant grew very luxuriantly at the nursery the year before we got it. And it became uh, so strong growing that I am afraid that such a stem as this would not fill in. So I'm just going to take that stem right out, do the same with this one here. Then we can reach down in the center. You notice this is where to make your cuts way down here where you can't see them later on. We can go over the, a whole plant just like this. Remove those branches that you don't want. And very, very soon you end up with a plant that is the shape that you'd like it to be and the size that you'd like it to be. Now that's not the only kind of a plant that we can want to prune here at this time of year. I want to talk also about pruning some of the annuals. And the first annual that I want to talk about pruning is the petunia. And I might say that, in a sense, this is not a real pruning process. It is the removal of the dead flowers so they won't set seeds. Now we look at a petunia blossom such as this one, which has gone by. Now you might say that, okay, I can remove the flower by just pulling off the dead flower like this. But that's not the key to it. The key is right down in the center here. This is where the seed pod has begun to develop. Now, the plant's mission in life is to make seeds and perpetuate its kind. If we continue to remove the flowers when they're faded, don't let those seed pods form, then they'll blossom all summer long. I want to introduce you to a new flower in this garden. This is called the Painted Tongue, or Salpiglossus. Very strange name. You may have passed over this in your seed catalogs, but next year try it. An annual, which grows 18 inches to two feet tall, blossoms, many shades, related to petunias, lasts all summer long. And three weeks ago, I planted this vertical garden. Now, we bought this kit at a garden center you can do the same thing. It's essentially a cylinder of, of wire, about two feet in diameter, lined with a waterproof paper, in this case called sisal craft, filled with potting soil. Then we simply cut little holes and plug the plants in here. As you can see, this lettuce planted just three weeks ago is already ready to be harvested. Well, now today I'm going to plant out some okra plants which have been growing in the greenhouse. Also set out some summer squash. I'm going to have a look at some perennials and do a little work on those. Then we're going in the greenhouse and take cuttings of some indoor type chrysanthemums, which will blossom in the fall. Well, the first thing I want to do today is to have you look at these peas. And this is the snow pea, or the edible potted pea, a variety called Oregon sugar pea. You notice how wide this row is. I really and truly put a lot of seeds, hundreds of seeds in here, and we get a magnificent crop. But this is how you should pick them. When these pods are still slender, before the peas themselves have, have formed, and then they're just as tender as can be. This is, the, this is when they're good. And that's the beauty of your home garden. You don't have to have tough ones. You have fresh ones. Then down beside it, you can see my bed of English daisies just about gone by for this season, but they're perennials. We can save the plants and set them out another year. I want to go to another variety of peas back here, and this is the one called Little Marvel. Now, Little Marvel has been growing 
rather strongly in this soil. This is a little richer than we really need it to be for peas, but they're growing very well. This, as you see, ready to harvest. This is the little marvel, a very sweet, wrinkled seeded pea and delicious to eat. Now we're still talking about peas. We'll look back at this variety, which has gone by now, the one called Alaska. Now you might say that that's the end of these vines. Well, not really, because these vines have been taking nourishment out of the soil all season long, and even out of the air, because this is a legume. And I'm going to save these vines, and they're going to go over in my compost pile, we'll end up by utilizing these, the nourishment in these vines for years and years to come. So we go right over to the compost pile here. Before I put the peas into the compost pile, I want you to see what else is already in there. Well, there's an old a cabbage leaf. Uh, here is a a, a dead rose, some marigolds, some grass clippings, all laid out in a rather a flat layer, sort of sandwich-like is the way you make up a compost pile. We'll try to spread these peas out somewhat in that same manner. Now these will rot down and become the greatest kind of fertilizer for your garden. But in order to, to, to speed the decay process, I'm going to add some commercial fertilizer. This is just a 10, 10, 10. I'm going to add a handful or so right on the top because the decay bacteria utilizes uh, uh, nitrogen. And so we're adding some of this to the, to the foliage so that we'll decay. Then we add soil, about an inch of soil on top of roughly six inches of organic matter. Easy enough to do. Now we'll cover this whole thing eventually and make a, a saucer-shaped depression in the middle. And then comes that final thing. We want to add moisture because the decay process will not continue unless the, uh, all of this material is soaking wet. Well, that's, this is how you make your compost. If I get some of that 10, 10, 10 fertilizer off my hands here. All right, now let me show you what the finished product, well, this is not quite finished. This is at the second stage of decay, but here it is. This is the brown gold you can't buy. You make it yourself out of garden waste. All right, that's your compost. Now I want to talk about asparagus beginning back were these plants which were set in here about 14 or 15 months ago. And you can see the luxuriant growth that they've made. They had compost underneath them. And here, down in this trench, is where I planted this year's asparagus bed. And this is just to demonstrate what growth can be made in a single season by fertilizing them properly. Now, what I'm going to do now is to hill soil in around these plants gradually during the season so that eventually by the end of the season the soil will be up uh, to this level the same as the original soil level. That will put the roots down where it's always cool and moist and also they'll be down deeply enough in the soil uh, so that you're not apt to disturb them in cultivating around them. Well, while we're talking about hilling up and filling in soil, I want to go over and do that same thing to my potatoes. And the first potatoes I want you to look at are the early varieties, right down in here. This one is Superior, and then we have Red Pontiac down in here, beginning to show some yellowing of foliage which tells me that these plants are not too far from being uh, ready to harvest. Eventually, the foliage will all turn yellow, shrivel up, and practically disappear, and then we'll pull these beautiful potatoes out of the soil. 
Back here we have a later variety planted a month after the other ones. They're now ready for the process called hilling up. And also, the foliage uh, looks to me to be a little bit light in color. So I'm going to give it a side dressing of a 510-5 fertilizer. And in this instance, simply take a little of the fertilizer and scatter it in a band on either side of the row. Now, don't get it up against the vines themselves. A little fertilizer like that. And then, take your hoe and, and heal up around the plants. Now, you notice what's happening here. I'm coming right up on the stems. What, is th what that is doing is covering up the weeds so there's no weeding to be done. It's burying the roots deeply down into the soil where they'll stay cool and moist. You must have moisture, you know, if you want those tubers to enlarge. You can hear a big truck over here on the highway. Maybe you hear it too today, a little bit of competition. But that's what we do with potatoes, and those will continue to grow until they reach maturity, and then eventually their leaves will turn yellow and we'll harvest them as well. Uh, six weeks ago, in the greenhouse, I planted some seeds of summer squashes, uh, one to a pot, and have allowed them to grow until this time, ready to set out directly into the garden to gain a little warm weather that is inside. Actually, I would like to have planted these two weeks ago, but they, because it was warm enough then to have set them out. But I'm going to grow three plants here in this garden. This one is called Patty Pan. This is a scalloped squash, light green in color. Uh, it should be picked when it's about two inches in diameter, just as sweet as can be at that stage. And down here we have one called Golden Girl. And this one is a zucchini type, the, the long one. Again, should be picked when it's about six or eight inches long. Now, I'm going to talk about the soil, and then we'll plant one of these. This soil is rich in compost, and this is some of that compost right from my compost pile. This is the kind of thing which I say you can't buy, you make for yourself. It's just as bit, every bit as good as any fertilizer, any manure that you'll ever buy. So, we have enriched the soil with this. We make a good hole for it like that tap this little fellow out of the pot. Oh, now take a peek at that uh, root system. You can see those white roots coming all over here. This plant is growing strongly at this stage, but is ready for moving on. So it goes right down into here. Now when you put a plant in like this, put some weight behind it and firm that in because firm contact with the soil is essential if you want to get those roots to take a hold right away. Now, you notice the next thing I'm doing? Making a little saucer-like depression around this plant, and then we'll give it a drink of water, just like that. And it's off and growing, you might say, this very moment. Well, the next thing I want to plant is called okra. And I'll bet you've never grown okra, especially if you live in the northern part of the country. You may not even have tasted it. But this is one of the really great vegetables, which is related to hollyhock. You pick the uh, immature flower buds, um, great for soups. Again, you see the root system coming on here. We'll set these out now. They could have gone out a couple of weeks ago because it's been warm enough for them. Again, they're a plant that likes the warm weather. It's no great trick to planting these. Just make that depression around, firm it in well, and again, give such plants as this a good drink of water. You should plant some okra in your garden too late this year, but next year, order some seeds and plant them if you've never done it before. I want to talk about mulching my tomatoes next. And before I actually mulch them, 
I'm going to talk about slugs. And I'll bet you, if you're a gardener, you have shed tears with slugs occasionally. Last year, we mulched this entire garden with hay. And I'll tell you, we had a slug battle from the first week on because beneath the hay, it was always dark and moist, a perfect breeding place for slugs. So this year, we've gone back to my old method of clean cultivation. We'll just keep the weeds out, keep the surface of the ground uh, scratch like this, very shallow cultivation. And this will really do the, the slugs in. There's no place for them to hide or to breed if you use clean cultivation. Now with all parts of the garden, we're gonna have clean cultivation except in the immediate vicinity of the tomato plants. And I'm going to mulch around those with this hay. But before I do that, I wanna talk about a physiological problem of tomatoes called blossom end rot. If you have ever picked from your garden, a tomato may be still green and the end opposite the stem uh, was sort of depressed and watery looking and eventually turned brown, then you know what blossom end rot is. You can't control by spraying. It's a physiological thing. It's related to uh, wet and dry situations in the soil. So that's why we're gonna keep the mulch on there to maintain an even degree of moisture. Secondly, it's, it is uh, related to the amount of calcium in the soil. Well, we had this soil this early this spring uh, with enough lime in it so that it tested 6.8, very close to neutral, a lot of lime. But during the waterings here, we have gradually washed some of that out so that yesterday this tested 6.0. Now maybe that's an idea for you to think about. Don't test your garden soil once in the year. Test occasionally to see what's, what might have happened. So I'm going to add some limestone, ordinary ground limestone, to the soil in the immediate vicinity of these plants. Now when that is, is scratched in and watered, it will increase the, the uh, pH here, so this will be back up to prevent this decay, this blossom end rot. Then we'll add this, in this case, it's just some salt marsh hay. Any kind of hay will do it, or grass clippings, or leaves, or anything of that manner. Something like that. Eventually, this will settle down. We may want to add a little bit more during the summer, but that is the secret to mulching your tomatoes to keep the soil moist. Well, I want to go from there over when we'll talk about the perennial garden. Now, back at this far end of the garden is a very attractive type of sage, which is called Salvia nemorosa. This dark purplish color with rich green leaves. The bugs don't seem to bother it. Uh, the bees love it. Uh, it's sort of a crinkly gray foliage, beautiful thing has been in blossom for 10 days and will continue for at least another 10 days or two weeks. Great plant to think of for your own perennial garden. Then next to it I have here a clump of dill. Now this dill is just beginning to uh, set its flower heads and you can see they haven't opened yet but they're getting ready. Well the next thing is we'll go into the seeding situation and this lovely dill will become brown and useless except for dried purposes. But if we would like to have some fresh dill, and this is what I'm going to suggest to you, about, about once a month, go out into your garden and just scratch a little patch like that and scatter a few dill seeds in it. it doesn't have to be, don't have to put in very many. Cover them over about a quarter of an inch deep and then keep that moist, and we'll get some nice dill plants come out of there. And, you'll, and if you plant them again and again during the season, you'll always have this to go on those sliced cucumbers or potato salad. We have all sorts of lovely things coming in bloom here in the perennial garden, but I especially wanted you to see the delphinium. A lot of people just 
would give anything to be able to grow the alfinium. And I should say, it's a plant that likes cool weather. Days like this are tough on it, the alfinium. We're having a real tropical heat wave today. Now, in this, this particular plant is the one I want to concentrate on. This is chives, which has gone to seed old clumps. The foliage is no longer tender, ready to, to use. So I'm going to simply cut these plants right back to the ground level. Now, this might seem a, a cool and heartless thing to do, but you just pull those right out of the way like that so that we end up with just the stubs. Now, within, within a week's time, get some of this stuff out of here, within a week's time, we'll have fresh young plants coming up here, four inches tall, just perfect to use in the kitchen. Well, I'm going to go to one more vegetable, and that is we're going to harvest some early beets. This is a variety called Pacemaker, and I want you to see that these are some which we started in a hotbed along in uh, the middle of March, transplanted here in the, in the garden in April. You can see how they look coming directly out of the garden here. Now this is the kind of thing which I want to say to you is what the home gardener has to look forward to. Get them when they're young and tender. The, the greens themselves are just as delicate and fresh as can be. You have a good vegetable. Uh, when you grow your own in your own garden, and these are easy to grow. But let's go in the greenhouse now. And I promised that I'd show you how to grow uh, some indoor type chrysanthemums which would blossom along late in the fall, perhaps in October or November. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if you have, kicking around your own house someplace, a chrysanthemum plant just such as this one, which flowered, oh, maybe you got it for Easter or Mother's Day or maybe even earlier in the year than that. The flowers finally went, went by and you were too soft-hearted to throw the plant away, so here you are with a great big plant, which will not do well if a left allowed to grow right here in this pot because it will have exhausted the nourishment in the soil. So what I'm going to do here is to take some cuttings of a plant like this. We'll root these, and uh, they will uh, then they'll be big enough to blossom again in November. Now. This is the key. Take off some of these lower leaves like that because you don't need all of those to make, uh, if you have too many on, the thing will wilt badly. Then also, remove the tip like this. So now we end up with a perfect cutting, three leaves on it. From the base of each leaf will come a stem. Immediately, instead of one stem, we're going to have three. Well, I'm going to dip this in water, and dip it in some rooting powder, Slip that right in like that, about so deep. Now we'll go ahead and make a number of these cuttings. You can see from a plant such as this, you can get a dozen cuttings without any trouble. Take the tip off. We've left, oh, about three leaves on that one again. Would be about right. Get them while they are fairly tender. Don't want those hard, woody stems. Come along like this, drop them in, firm them well. Now these should have a drink of water, and then give them their own little greenhouse. Slip them in a plastic bag so that they have a little greenhouse of their own. Put them in a place where there is bright light, but not full sun. In two weeks' time, they will have roots on them. Then we transplant them into potting soil in a fresh, fresh soil in a fresh pot. We'll grow them all summer and have blossoms in the fall. Well, let's get to a few questions today. I'd like to wish we had more time for questions every week. This first one I was very pleased to get from Missoula, Montana. This lady says, the potatoes I planted, and which came up in May, were nipped by frost. I hilled them up and new growth came again, but so did the frost. They look pretty bad, but there are a few green side shoots making a brave effort to grow now. What should I do? One, let them stay and hope they'll produce. 
Two, dig them up and plant others instead. Three, give up on potatoes and plant beans or carrots. Well, at the high altitude where you live, Mrs. Shoemaker, almost anything can happen, as you know, in the way of frosts. Potatoes love cold weather. The fact that they were nipped a little bit won't really hurt them. The minute, uh, what the nipping does is actually make more stems come from underneath. You should let them stay in the ground and you'll get a good crop this fall. Now, this letter comes from Bradenton, Florida. Our geraniums are prolific, but with no blooms. They also lack the dark green ring on the leaf. Any suggestions? Well, I thought you might like to see a geranium like this with those dark uh, zones, which is sometimes called a zonal geranium. What your plant is running into, I think, is soil which is too moist and perhaps not enough sunshine. In your personal situation, I'd advise trying to grow them in pots Try to keep the soil a little on the dry side, and for goodness sakes, don't overfeed them, and I think you'll get some blossoms. From London, Ontario, many of us are really appreciating your show in southwestern Ontario. Can you tell me about the culture and harvest of horseradish roots? Well, begin in the fall when you harvest them. Dig the roots at that time save some of the roots and replant them in good rich soil, setting the plants about 15 inches apart. Now in order to get long fat roots in the spring when they've made six or eight inches of growth, dig around each individual plant and remove the side roots without removing the main root that goes down, the tap root. That's the way you get those big fat roots. It's almost impossible to kill horseradish. It'll live for many, many years. Uh, will the addition of chemical fertilizers to a compost pile to speed decay kill the beneficial insects? Well, I want to answer that by uh, telling you about my dad, who was a great fisherman. And he not only knew where the tr good trout were, he knew where the good worms were, and they were in my compost pile. And I would suggest that the chemical fertilizers, if anything, will benefit them rather than to hurt them. Uh, let me see. Well, they say that's all the time I have for this program. Next week, we're going to plant some primroses and divide bearded iris. I'm going to show you how to grow sweet peas and I get you a peek at some of those of mine that are in blossom right now. And then we're going to talk about the summer care or the vacation care of houseplants. This is Jim Crockett on Crockett's Victory Garden. I hope you enjoy the program every week. Thank <laughs> you.